Complex functions are often much better behaved than their real counterparts, especially if they are analytic. In this video, we will see a very nice property of analytic functions. They all have a Taylor search expansion. Something like this is certainly not true for real functions. So why does this very strong proper property hold for analytic functions? That is what you will learn in this video. So if your function f of z is analytic in some uh, a a circle, circular disk around at zero, then you know <coughs> that it has a Taylor series, you know the form of a Taylor series, n derivative and z0 over uh, n factorial times that minus z0 to the power n and sum over it uh, in, uh, inside, the unit, uh, inside the disk around uh, z0. So why is it true? We will show this for center zero, doesn't really matter where, where the center is of course. But just to make the notation a bit easier, we use set zero equals zero, and we will show why this holds. Well, we may we will make the following construction: we have an arbitrary z inside our uh, circle with radius uh, capital R. Well, because our z over here is inside, it has a distance small r uh, to the or origin. Then I know I can find some r0 in between small r and capital R. So we have some r0 in between small r and capital R, and that's the circle over here, this radius r0. Uh, and now we're going to use Cauchy's integral formula, which tells us that I can find our f of z. Our f of z equals 1 over 2 pi i times uh, a contour integral along C0, where C0 is the circle with radius R0, FSTS <coughs> times uh, 1 over S minus Z. How is this going to help? I mean, I'm looking for a series, and now we have some integral. How are we ever going to find a power series? Well, let's take a look. Um, we know if you have a complex number Xi, that sum m from 0 to capital M minus 1 xi uh, of xi to the uh, uh, power n, so uh, 1 plus xi plus xi squared plus xi to the power n minus 1 equals 1 minus xi to the power n divided by 1 minus xi, 1 minus last term divided by 1 minus xi. So no problems here, this is just a finite sum. So we can uh, solve for uh, one, minus xi, 1 over 1 minus xi, 1 over 1 minus xi is the same sum, and then I just subtract xi to the power n over 1 minus xi, so over here. Why do we do that? Uh, well, uh, now we rewrite this f of s divided by s minus z as f of s divided by s times 1 over 1 minus z to the power, uh, 1 over 1 minus z over s. And why do we do that? Well, our z is living here, inside our circle, and the s is living on the blue circle. So the norm of z over s will be something smaller than 1, and that is important. So, and, and that's why we like to have a z over s. Now we are going to be able to expand this. Um, so we just keep our f over s and we will use our the expression for 1 over 1 minus xi which we found over here and just plug it in over here where we have xi now equals uh, z over s so xi to the power n over here yields z to the power n over s to the power n and here we have again a z to the power n over s to the power n now with a capital n and 1 minus xi equals z over s. How does this help? Well, we can plug in this big expression into our integral over here and plug it in over here. But now, uh, first we have a finite sum, and because we have a finite sum, we can take it in front of the integral, so that happens there, and we have some rubbish. That's this, and we call the rubbish is rho capital N of z. 
And now we're going to show that this uh, first part uh, converges to the, the series we want. And it's this row n over z, it's, it's the remainder. We're going to show that that uh, goes to zero, capital N goes to infinity. Uh, because now we recognize that this part here is just again Cauchy's integral formula, but now the n derivative in zero divided by n factorial. So our f of z equals some power series in z to the power n, coming from here plus some remainder. So all we still have to do is to show that the remainder goes to zero. So how are we going to uh, kill this integral over here? Or we're going to use an ML estimate. Uh, integral is smaller than, uh, sorry, if the norm of the integral is smaller than some capital N, uh, then the integral, is, uh, the norm of the integral is smaller than this, the length of the integration interval times this uh, number. Well, First of all, we know that we have to estimate this one. Norm of S minus Z is triangle inequality bigger or equal than norm of S minus norm of Z equals R minus R zero. Furthermore, we have an analytic function which is bounded, so we know that the F of Z is smaller than some capital N on C zero. So we can estimate our uh, remainder. It's equal to the length of C0, so that gives a 2 pi R0 times uh, the maximum of the integrand. Uh, we have a factor of 1 over 2 pi, of course. The F is bounded by M. The norm of uh, Z is just capital R. Norm of S equals R0. And we have estimated 1 over S minus Z with R minus R0. And then let's clean up some of the mess. So we have factors 2 pi which cancel out. Uh, uh, so, so we are left with an R0 over there, R minus R0 over here, capital M over there. That's all fine because it's all finite. And an R over R0 to the power n. Now the R is bigger than the R0, so R over R0 is smaller than the 1. So if we take the limit capital and to uh, infinity, then the uh, modulus of the row n will be zero. So if we take limits capital n to infinity on both sides over here, we get f of z sum n to infinity, n derivative in uh, z, uh, uh, z zero over n factorial times z minus z zero to the power n for arbitrary z zero. And that's uh, exactly the expression for the uh, Taylor series. So given the fact that f of z is analytic, we are heavily rely on that. We are using Cauchy's integral formula all the time. So given that f is analytic, we can use Cauchy's integral formula, and then we can show that f of z uh, has a Taylor series ex uh, <coughs> expansion. So you know, now know that every analytic function has a Taylor series.